the Cameron story I told you about. Uh, uh, hello, I'm John from Broadsheet. Um, can you not hear me? You're Brad, going. Can you all, I can hear you. Yes, there's a bit oh. of echo on it. Oh, really? Okay. Um, uh, we're live now. Uh, um, I'll just check the. You're fine now. Fine now. Great. Uh, welcome uh, to tomorrow tonight. Uh, we're joined by Bernard Purcell uh, in London. He's the editor of the Irish World. Good evening, Bernard. Good evening, John. How are you? I'm grand. Yourself? I'm very well. Um, now, we can see your street, but there's a warning. There is a, a viewer warning. <laughs> uh, Some people leave their curtains open. Okay, yeah. yeah. We won't mention the, the naked guy across the road. Okay. okay. Only if he shows up, only if he appears. Um, uh, Bernard, uh, just want to go to the Irish world first, mm -hmm. but as you're the only person I know who's got the AstraZeneca jab, uh, you got the first dose. Mm -hmm. um, how are you with all the AstraZeneca news? Uh, you ask me every time, and the, the answer is always the same. It's balance of risk. The um, benefits far outweigh the risks of um, catching uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Is your second dose, that's not under, under threat or anything like that? Is there... A, not a, not a, that I'm aware of, but it's some way off. It's not until the end of May. Right. Um, okay. Sorry. I just wanted to. I didn't want to get it uh, personal. Uh, no side. No. You, you've been fine since then, haven't you? As far as I'm aware, but you'd have to ask other people who've seen these strange <laughs> behaviour. Okay. How, how do you find? I mean, are you, you're following the stories about AstraZeneca, of course, of and course. now Johnson and Johnson, and all of the others, and um, the sometimes you. Um, I mean, that'd be, I think uh, probably Leo Varadkar summed it up when I think was he asked if he was offered it, could he take it? And he said, yes, of course he would. And he has, med yeah. and he has medical training and um, he's never struck me as somebody who's likely to uh, martyr himself. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, then. Uh, trust Leo, I guess, <laughs> is, the, is the message. No, trust. There, there are... Um, uh, there's plenty of good people working on this. The uh, risks themselves, uh, it's inevitably going to, you're going to have uh, people finding things on an ad hoc basis as you go along, because this was such an expedited, accelerated process. We yeah. have seen uh, that, um, I mean, there's an example of that with the government holding back now on uh, giving approval to this uh, latest vaccine. Uh, um, but so inevitably, you, but when you look at the sheer numbers, um, I mean, the actual chance uh, of it happening, it's still not even established that uh, the vaccine is the cause of these particular anomalies that we've seen. Um, it's not cause and effect, but there does appear, to, I'm not sure that it's even a correlation, but it is something that has to be observed and has to uh, be explored further. But um, the, if you look at the sheer empirical scale of uh, people who have had the vaccination, um, and the ability to roll that out decreases the uh, at least the risk of infectiousness, and, and especially when there's multiple vaccinations or multiple vaccines available. So uh, it, nothing is uh, entirely safe, but um, it's a vanishingly small risk with um, this particular vaccine. Uh, London uh, kind of uh, relaxed a little last night, didn't it? Oh, went bonkers. It went stark staring bonkers. It was quite nice uh, to see the um, some of our regular shops in that open today, but uh, certainly there was a kind of pent up uh, reaction uh, in and around Soho, uh, Oxford Street. Um, and I, it should be noted that um, some of the some of his own party was surprised at the extent uh, today to which Boris Johnson uh, warned that the bringing the numbers of infections and deaths down has been down almost entirely to lockdown and not to the vaccinations, he said, because he has said that there will be, and he's acknowledging it, in the coming weeks, there will be more infections as people, as you see scenes like last night, um, and there will be more deaths, um, but it's a question of the extent. Uh, so they do, uh, people, there is a fear and there's a, a in government that people will think, right, it's all over now, uh, it's grand, we can get back to normal. And I think in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon has given that impression, but then she's coming up to an election yeah. uh, very soon. Um, so that they've found that messaging unhelpful 
um, because they do want people to still um, maintain social distancing, good habits like washing hands, wear a mask, uh, because uh, we're not out of it yet. Okay. Um, just want to go to the Irish world, uh, which is out tomorrow in Britain and uh, Ireland on Thursday. Uh, this is a, a story I, I had no idea about these pension payouts. It was agreed in principle back in 2014. And then uh, when Stormont was uh, in limbo in 2019, I think people like Julian Smith, uh, who is held in very, very high regard and he's competent and um, principled and conscientious, which was one of the reasons we believe Boris Johnson fired him as Northern Ireland secretary. <laughs> uh, but um, the, it, uh, there was a trial, uh, there were, well, there is not a trial, not a trial, I should um, one of the hooded men has been um, taking an action in the yeah. High Court in, um, in an attempt to ensure <coughs> that the Stormont government, and by extension, the British government with its block grant or its funding, uh, will honour its commitment to uh, compensate uh, victims of the troubles. You know, he, um, he was one of, I think, 14 people who were tortured and subjected to extreme rendition long before it was um, called extreme rendition. They were being right. thrown out of uh, helicopters, uh, being subjected to torture. To, uh, the people were interned in 71. Uh, right. But in the case, uh, during uh, his application, the uh, judge was assured um, by both uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin, by Conor Murphy, that the money will be made available and it will be paid on time. It's estimated that it may cost about 1.2 billion over 20 years. Um, which, to be honest, is quite cheap at the price. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, victims um, who must have not been at fault, which was one of the things that the Tories insisted on because of a particular um, uh, fear that... Um, Terrorists. That, that, yes, uh, might be seen to be compensated or rewarded in their eyes. But um, so people in Britain and people, uh, presumably, if there are any... Um, survivors of the Dublin and Monaghan bombings, although it will be a judge-led panel. Um, the payments will be uh, backdated to 2014, that between 2010, uh, from what I've seen, uh, estimated between 2,000 and 10,000 a year uh, for the um, recipients of life, and upon the death, upon their death, their spouse or carer um, will uh, get, continue to receive it for another 10 years. So it's a positive story. It's a good story. It's welcome. As I said, people like yeah. Julian Smith uh, pushed for it. Um, and at the same time, um, yesterday we saw that um, a lady who died in um, 1988, uh, having been shot by the Paris in um, Bloody Sunday, and mother of 14, um, who was then abused by Paris, who came into the house when people tried to rescue her, um, the, her children or her estate uh, got 250,000 and the judge was, uh, I think he was only appointed a judge about two or three years ago, uh, McEnany, I think might be his name, um, of QC, but he was scathing about uh, the MOD and about the uh, Paris behavior. So <laughs> it, this legacy is still with us. There are things that do matter, but um, the most important thing about the pensions is that done properly and done with goodwill and in good faith, it could be one modest step towards a proper reconciliation process, especially the fact that uh, you've managed to get uh, both DUP and uh, Sinn Féin singing from the same hymn sheet on it. And would that include people who were interned uh, with uh, innocent people who were who were interned in? The well, same... they have. Um, it's it's people who may have been physically uh, injured or psychologically traumatized right. by a terror by a violent terrorist event. So okay. there could be an explosion, it could be a murder. Um, I think, and they have to, you have to convince this judge-led panel as well. Mm. Uh, so... Um, and it's open to people in the South, obviously, for, as you say, the, the Dublin... Yes, not just, ju not just people in Northern Ireland. And in London too, for that kind of Harrods it's, spot? Well, I, so, I mean, that's the logical inference to be drawn from that. That's what it says. Uh, yeah. so, and I would have thought from the uh, Conservatives' point of view, and yeah, well, any British political party, um, it would make that a lot more saleable to people here, particularly, say, the uh, campaigners in Birmingham who are still looking for justice after the... Uh, um, the bombings there, yeah. yeah in uh, 74. But as I said, it, it has the potential, a, a modest step towards um, some kind of uh, peace and reconciliation. That, uh, yeah. So... 
Uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, this is a funny story. Um, Liam Dolan is now the Queen's botanist. Is that right? That's correct. Um, actually, T.G. Cahar had this at the weekend. But, uh, uh, and it was one of his students whom he taught Irish to. Uh, he's uh, in Oxford. Um, he was based in Oxford as a botanist. Um, and he taught uh, undergraduates uh, Irish for free. But he has been appointed as the Queen's representative to um, uh, Kew Gardens, the Royal Botanic Gardens, to... Uh, update it because they, um, in that household now, not least because of the efforts of uh, both Philip and Charles, there's a greater awareness of environmental matters and green matters. And yeah. so uh, he, that's his role, that's his job there. Uh, so right. we, we just have to, it was um, quite a nice, um, it just shows the kind of, uh, that there's a, it's not a one, a, Irish people in Britain, it's not a one dimensional. Uh, no, 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 completely. And uh, the timing, I suppose they had to wait till Philip died to get a paddy to get a paddy in there. <laughs> um, I think, and uh, there's always been goodwill from, um, uh, from. I mean, I think I told you this before on one of your late night discussions years ago. Uh, the Queen Mother used to um, be very, very friendly with a former Irish ambassador here, uh, and they used to exchange uh, racing tips, and that was the uh, so that was the basis of their uh, friendship. And this was yeah. at a time of particular strain. Uh, between Dublin and London, but um, there's all, yeah. um, and I think um, Queen Mother's uh, wasn't the Queen Mother's her their her kind of uh, butler backstairs Johnny was he Irish was he an Irish guy I don't I'm, right. I'm afraid I don't know um, I know that uh, famously she used to uh, go back and say would one of you old queens give this queen a gin and tonic <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's always been I think uh, I mean one of the things one of the points we make this week is that. Um, both Philip and uh, the Queen had always, wherever they could, and this was acknowledged even by Michelle O'Neill in Stormont, and before that by her predecessor, uh, Martin McGuinness, uh, the, the royals have tried where they can, either through a visit to Northern Ireland or uh, with, say, the unofficial visits from Mary Robinson and Mary McAleese, if to give, to give some kind of positive context and try and nudge things along in a positive, helpful context. And uh, that was one of the reasons in particular that, uh, say, um, Philip is understood to have uh, insisted or suggested that uh, Michael D uh, stay at uh, Windsor Castle during that uh, 2014 visit. But um, is that right? Uh, yeah. uh, but the Queen and uh, Philip in uh, 2011, there's absolutely no doubt that visit was transformative in terms of the goodwill and the opening up of warmth between uh, ordinary people in both countries, which is yeah. why it makes um, Boris Johnson's conduct in recent years all the more heartbreaking and I think it's uh, seen as squandering uh, the progress that's been made in that relationship. We yeah. saw it again today with Brandon Lewis uh, uh, ignoring a recommendation by William Hague that there should be a sort of open rolling summit um, of the British and Irish governments and the parties uh, in Northern Ireland. Right, uh, this is Hague in the Times today, isn't it? He's, yes, yeah. that's right, he's become a co um, He's it's funny, people like himself and Portillo have actually matured into a good statesman. They were brash and uh, yeah. probably came into office too young uh, when they did. Uh, now they actually bring a bit of gravitas and context. Yeah, um, I remember Haig at like age 12 in the, at the Tory party conference. <laughs> yes. Uh, but he has, he has matured. In fact, uh, he was pretty unlucky, wasn't he? I mean, as a, as a Tory leader in terms of timing and on, on the, all that. Yes, but uh, yeah. that's so. Uh, when you, you sorry, he's more personable than uh, Cameron, as I, I would regard him as. I think virtually anybody is more personable than Cameron. <laughs> yeah, is he going to end up in in prison? This guy. I mean, it's. Well, I think Johnson's going to have some sadistic sport with him with this uh, inquiry into uh, lobbying that um, he said has been given carte blanche, but doesn't actually have any uh, statutory remit so to speak, but uh, there's no love lost between no. them. So I think uh, it'll, uh, that he's I think they're going to enjoy giving Cameron a bit of a kicking. Uh, yeah. but certainly uh, Cameron's reputation, um, such as it was, uh, is um, not enhanced by uh, the, but we've been talking about this now for about three weeks. Yeah. It's now getting legs. Yeah, and uh, exactly because uh, well, if it's in the papers for three weeks, you know, you, you know, it's in the, you're in trouble, don't you? Isn't that the 
Well, it's been small, slow burners, but yes. And uh, I mean, given that his only paid job has been as a PR man, um, uh, what's interesting today is some of the collateral damage because uh, Rishi Sunak was nowhere to be seen when um, Labour um, called a question. Uh, it was left to a junior uh, business minister. Um, no. And normally Rishi Sunak is keen to um, claim credit for any scheme, yeah. and, but not on this occasion. Another Boris kind of uh, uh, adversary, really, isn't he? Uh, so Boris has a kind of get throwing man Rishi into it. it has uh, a lot of problems, I think. Yes, and uh, you've, uh, the late Jeremy Haywood, the former cabinet secretary, uh, is understood to have uh, okayed an awful lot of uh, the embedding of um, uh, Green Soil into cabinet, and also um, the story that's on uh, a lot of tomorrow's front pages is the uh, head of uh, government procurement um, is working both as uh, one of the most senior civil servants and um, on the board, or certainly working for Green Soil at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. and that was approved by the cabinet office. But uh, mm -hmm. that was when uh, Cameron was prime minister, it was 2015. So. Well, it's not looking good, is it, from at all? Um, the Irish Examiner. Uh, Bernard, uh, scrambled to get vaccine rollout back on track uh, after uh, the pause on the AstraZeneca. Can I, can I play something for you quickly? Yes, just, of course. It was, uh, it's just only, um, also tonight, you know, the mandatory, mandatory hotel quarantine has been paused. Mm -hmm. it, I saw that and uh, uh, saw that um, it was getting, uh, they were trying to contort themselves in all sorts of uh, ways to accommodate different people. Sorry, go on. No, 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 I'll just, I'll just play uh, Donnelly tonight, um, Stephen Donnelly, Minister for House. Uh, operating on a precautionary principle. Uh, we are getting close to the capacity of the system, as, particularly within the context of so many countries having been added. So the system's only 18 days old, uh, and in, in, uh, in that time we've gone from 33 countries up to over 70 countries, including very big countries like France, Italy, the United States and Canada. So... There's a lot of new capacity coming online on Monday. We'll be moving up from about 650 to about 960 rooms. And then again, the following Monday, we'll be moving up a significant amount again, up to about 1,300 rooms. We have to make sure that people, when they are arriving, have a uh, room. So the carriers should only be letting people on the flights when they can show proof of a pre-flight PCR, of a passenger locator form, and of a room booked in hotel quarantining. One of the problems we have is there's a small number of carriers uh, who don't appear to be doing that. I know that Minister Ryan has been engaged and his department engaged with the carriers to make sure that happens. But what we need to make sure is that there is capacity within the system for these so-called walk-ins who don't have a booking. <laughs> That's um, uh, the Tonight Show um, Virgin Media. Sorry, I don't laugh. He's an incredibly hapless kind of character, isn't he? <laughs> Mr. Donnelly, Minister Donnelly. Well, I mean, I think it would be a challenge for any of us, uh, in fairness. Um, but um, I, the, the the Dubai two were released tonight, or uh, were checked out at the hotel tonight. I saw that, and they had a brief spell, uh, ever so briefly, in uh, Mount Joy as well. Uh, yeah. It just it I'm, it's hard not to have a great deal of sympathy for them uh, because it, I don't think they could have envisaged uh, being landed in uh, this kind of uh, farrago. Yeah. Um, so the mandatory hotel quarantine system isn't. Um, I don't know what what the future of that is. I my, I suspect that the high court wouldn't even hear the cases yesterday. If they struck them out. I suspect. I mean, it's in violation violation of the constitution. I would imagine. But if these emergency law rules override that, uh, I don't know. But the high court. Uh, I mean, three people have been let let out now. Mm -hmm. um, One imagines they have, there could have been a much simpler and easier way to uh, finesse this while ensuring public health and public safety and getting agreement that they voluntarily um, uh, quarantine at home. I think I understand, or just from reading the reports, that uh, they were suddenly faced with the prospect of a bill that uh, most of us would struggle to pay if it was demanded immediately, uh, just with the hotel quarantine even though um, they were coming back from what seems to be a kind of uh, luxury destination. But uh, I think the means appear to have been rather more modest than that might suggest. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the whole strategy. Uh, 
Well, this is quite a funny story, Bernard. Did you see this? Um, I did. The pr- priest in Kerry, uh, I'm wondering whether Catholics should pay the TV license fee. Yeah, after the uh, Fair City confession, um, they portrayed a confession, and it was it was it was uh, the confession was carried out in front of the altar. There was no, you know, um, uh, none of the requirements of the Catholic Church. You know, the, the things to be in place. It was sort of a face to face, I think, confession. <laughs> so um, the priest said. Don't pay the license fee, you know, if they're going to be so cavalier with the. Uh, well, that'd be an interesting standoff to see. Um, we haven't really come that far from the bishop in the 90s, have we? No, <laughs> it is a kind of it's, it's a bang of that, but uh, I suppose they should have got it right. You know, you kind of, you know, um, this is the mother and baby home, b- b- baby homes burial build problem, problematic. I might come back to that, actually, if that's OK. Uh, OK. A uh, pandemic will have added 35 billion to the national debt by the end of the year. Um, the Evening in Echo, uh, women gambling, uh, women are spending tens of thousands of euro in online ga- casinos with a rise in probably gambling during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, on, you're talking about the 35 billion they're added to the national debt by the end of the year. Um, I think we've discussed this in the past that the discussion of national debt is always. Um, done in a very misleading way, as if it's uh, essentially maxing out the uh, credit card and it's uh, like a domestic budget. It's not. I mean, um, if a government's first duty is to look after its people um, and to protect them, well, then it has to do whatever is necessary. It can raise funds. It raised funds to bail out the banks. It uh, can raise funds on the bond market, on the international market. Uh, if um, this can be staggered over so it, without being for whole it can be staggered it can be uh, tailored uh, it's the cost of uh, keeping people safe right um 35 billion i mean what's another 30 what's another, what's another what's 35 billion over 50 years or 100 years well on top of the 2008 stuff mm-hmm. uh, well, uh, it could be 100 billion i mean we could be <laughs> the national debt could be technically well, we put 60 billion in the hole to them. Or? You remember the 1980s, don't you? And you remember uh, Dick Spring and Garrett Fitzgerald telling us about the national debt, which I think was uh, 26 billion at the time. And uh, then after that, they, uh, I think people were on, uh, it didn't take, uh, you didn't have to be earning much to get on to 65%. And then uh, the three 1% levies and uh, PRSI. So uh, then a couple of years later, in Iraq, we were happy. Go, we were happy. You're happy, Bernard. Uh, there's an element of that, but I'm still talking, even in the pre-Tiger years, they did discover debt management. I mean, because at the same time uh, that uh, the debt never seemed to shrink, the tax yeah. seemed to rise all the time. Uh, yeah. Public sec- public service and public spending seemed to be cut all the time, and it seemed to be pulling in contradictory directions with uh, Labour with its own particular public sector constituency and uh, Fine Gael with its uh, deserving poor um, <laughs> philosophy. Um, so, but then I think they brought in some professional um, uh, uh, people uh, like Dermot Desmond and others who uh, structured the finance, the uh, country's finances in a much more modern 20th century way. And then um, the tiger, and then it all went pear shaped. Well, that was, that was in part because people had access to credit. They didn't have access to wealth. Um, but that was also because of the, I mean, yeah. the inflation of uh, the um, property market. The um, Yes, we all know what happened. And we know that uh, private debt was nationalized and that uh, a, a couple of generations will be paying for it. Yeah. Um... The, this, the Irish sun has just come in um, again, you know, the vaccine rollout wobble, shot down. Um, show leak gaff over Sunday's new star. Are, have you been watching Line of Duty? Are you? I uh, have, yeah, it's, I have. <laughs> it's, is, I've, is, been, is, I've been watching it since 2012. Uh, right. what's, what's interesting, Jed Mercurio uh, did some really interesting uh, uh, medical dramas. He's a former uh, doctor uh, of, 20, 25 years ago, and uh, things like cardiac arrest, which if you know anybody in the NHS, say it's a clo- it's very, very accurate. Um, right. Line of duty has been ever more progressively daft and over the top 
and, and for those reasons. But what is interesting is a couple of slide digs at the BBC, a couple of slide digs um, at the Jimmy Savile. I think, um, there's a monologue from Ted Hastings, uh, the Adrian Dunbar character, um, in which he asks, when did we uh, stop caring about our leaders telling lies and uh, just being corrupt? <laughs> just, it, and it seemed opposite um, and it seemed uh, and it got under the nose, under the radar of the BBC, because quite a few people um, thought that uh, it was a bit of a siren call. Uh, and he's uh, he's the things that he had in the episodes in 2012, which um, uh, are now actually coming through um, in, in episodes now, uh, nearly a decade later. But it um, is tosh. It's absolute tosh. But it's right. Okay. Tosh. Okay. And uh, it's great on Dunbar. Like he's is he Irish? He is Irish, isn't he? It, yes, of course he is. Yeah, of course he is. Yeah. Sorry. Um, he did he hear had, my song, didn't he? The he, that film, didn't he make that film? The hear, hear my, my song? song, the Joseph Locke uh, one. Yeah, it was fantastic. And before that, he played a, um, a, a London gangster in a TV series here called The Fear. Uh, but he's a regular at the um, Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith yeah. and uh, supports a lot of causes. Um, and mm. so, uh, there's been Great though, isn't it? It's fantastic for him. I mean, it's like uh, well, he's always been um, supportive and working on different projects and things like uh, this ch uh, the Channel Five. Uh, drama that he's, he features regularly in our paper, but uh, there's quite a healthy uh, kind of production, um, TV production industry going on at the moment. I think there's one current uh, program um, which is ostensibly set over here, and it has an Irish uh, actress, uh, but it was all shot around the uh, Hope, but it's supposed to be the UK. And now you get, uh, say, Belfast. Uh, um, is the backdrop for a uh, line of duty. So, um, with, uh -huh. and there's none of the shillelagh stuff or the, it's just um, Ireland as a modern backdrop, but it sometimes stands in for other countries. And you've seen it with all the things like the uh, those TV series. Uh, uh, that, and is, is Dunbar, Dunbar's Irishness, is that a feature of the show or is it referred to? Oh, very much so, because he, um, he's actually made popular expressions like, now you're sucking diesel, and um, very, oh, things, right. people had never heard before, and uh, which yeah. has causes anybody familiar with them to smile. So they, okay. uh, yeah, and yeah. they play up to it. Uh, it, was, it, was, it uh, the other um, actor, the small fellow with the beard, whose name, uh, I apologize, whose name uh, alludes me at the moment, his normal accent is very, very Scottish. Um, but so he has to keep this kind of estuary accent on. Uh, right. And uh, then you Vicky McClure, who's the... Uh, but they've had a series of very, very uh, high, impressive actors, actors and actresses, and they don't care who they kill off, which has become part of the, um, the, the destination viewing of it on Sunday nights. It was right. really a small program on BBC Two during the uh, Olympics, but then uh, by the season two, uh, it became something of uh, yeah. That's 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 the thing, wasn't it? It was sort of one of these sort of whatever um, graveyard sh sh shows, you know, uh, that became uh, sort of from the ground up, wasn't it? Like if it was people like you who were just watching it, and then it just grew and grew. But as you say, it's become potty. Uh, like the the plot lines are not. Oh, they always were. They always were. But, they, uh, but it's uh, um, it goes. It's a kind of more. Um, domestic kitchen sink type um, of the kind of thing James Elroy writes, where you have this overweening corruption uh, of right. police force and conspiracy theories. But it's uh, done very, very, it, it's very slick, very, uh, people, uh, it's one of the um, BBC's uh, big successes. In fact, there was quite a lot of discussion over the weekend when you had the blanket uh, coverage of um, the death of Philip uh, with yeah. uh, the BBC channels repeating the same output and uh, they, I think they also took BBC4 off the air and um, I, there was a lot of um, uh, restiveness about it uh, because uh, that they thought BBC was trying to shape public opinion rather than that. Uh, yeah. And, um, and he was divisive. I mean, come on, Bernard, wasn't he? I mean, he well, was a divisive character, Philip. You know, but, but, but I, what I was going to say yeah, sorry. Was, was inter uh, uh, a number of people wondering would if they had not screened uh, Line of Duty on Sunday, that would probably have been uh, the step too far. And um, so right. there was quite a lot of uh, discussion about that on social media. And um, when is the funeral? It's on Saturday in Windsor. Right. right. Is is London closed for that? I mean, is it, oh, it's very quiet, isn't it? It's a sort of a mm -hmm. 
yeah, 30 people. In fact, um, the Telegraph mentions the fact that the Queen will have to sit alone at the funeral. I just oh, to- has, has opted to. She resumed her duties today, uh, the retirement of, um, I think, what it is, um, I think Lord Peel, um, who has a um, role in the House of Lords. But uh, she went straight back to her duties today. Right. Uh, and would sit alone. That's very uh, sort of sad image. Um, this is the, the, I mean, you know that I'm, I'm a rat, you know, I'm my rat licking, I'm a conspiracy theorist, effectively. Um, the qu- massive, uh, the qu- quarter of virus deaths not caused by COVID. This is what I've been saying at the, since, since the beginning. The cause to speed up roadmap is 23% of recent deaths are with disease rather than from it. That was the point was, you know, right from the start, there was a suicide and then a victim here in Spain and who had been classified as a, because he had COVID and there was a car crash, wasn't there, in Britain? Um, there's still about 150,000 deaths that were directly uh, related to COVID. If um, you, there are arguments that can be made, which is why they changed the reporting, I think, uh, last summer, uh, which is why the deaths within 28 days of exhibiting symptoms. So uh, they have actually tried to skew the balance and you don't have, uh, they've tried to exclude instances where uh, COVID is on the death certificate to, um, it has to be within so many days of presenting the symptoms. Um, the, it might, had, had that story appeared somewhere else, I might be more inclined to be sympathetic. Um, right, because the Telegraph, okay. Um, yeah, okay. It's, it, it's something that's baffled me though. And I, I mean, 23% well, recently- look at the sta- Look at the stand first. Um, it's keep it, call to speed up roadmap as 20%. Yeah. It's an attempt to delegitimize or undermine the, the statistical evidence um, that of um, an unfortunate management of the pandemic and the outbreak because uh, they were slow to uh, respond over here. So okay. the, the narrative is being established and you have the ultras within the Tory party who want to uh, go back to uh, speed up the reopening, uh, ignore, well, ignore experts, ignore the epidemiologists, ignore that. I mean, there is a slow, okay. steady return. The main reason for that is to see if there will be a spike in the five weeks between um, after each gradual lockdown, which is why um, we will have next, we have, I think, uh, May. The students um, are due to go back, I think. It's yeah, but don't you, th- don't you think, Bernard, in, in just in terms of uh, public um, perception, if a quarter of recent deaths are with the disease rather than from it, a quarter of these recent deaths, uh, wouldn't that uh, have a have a, an effect upon public perception? I mean, if it came from a reputable and uh, a reputable well, source, I, that's in quotes, um, and it is being tailored to suit a, a different argument. Uh, okay, if, okay. If Riker or uh, De- Debbie Streetar or um, the director of the Welcome Institute or, or any of uh, the people who aren't ideologues don't have an axe to grind uh, well, and have ex. Mm-hmm. There are some. Uh, well, the Welcome Institute uh, would suggest Welcome Pharmacy, so they do have a re- vested interest. In... The Welcome Institute is about public health. It's, it is it's like the, um, the British Library. The British it does have a public health role, um, so it. Uh, it it's is... funded by, funded by Big Pharma. That's all. I mean, I'm not being. I don't want to. Get into the rattling. In, uh... the, welcome, the Welcome Institute is um, considered an honest broker in this, and it is a um, it is a source of expertise. Okay. There's um, this is the uh, top seal surgeon's role at Scandal Hit uh, Greensill. This is the guy who was double jobbing. He was a board member of Greensill and uh, procurement manager. Is that right? That's right. Incredible. He's on one hundred and sixty thousand, um, but then um, I think his shares. At one point, his uh, share options before the company tanked uh, would have been worth a few million. Uh, Cameron is now uh, telling people that, uh, having boasted by all accounts to his friends and to his circle that his um, shares or his share options would have been worth something like 60 million, um, says that you know, it was never anything like that. But uh, the other thing that uh, Cameron has been spinning is that photograph which uh, you sort of went by 
which oh. is on the Telegraph and is also on the Mirror. Um, that meeting took place shortly after the uh, gentleman who's sitting with the Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia uh, was um, understood by the CIA, the CIA and others to have uh, had um, the Washington Post journalist um, murdered and chopped up. Um, the Khashoggi. 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 And um, when this was uh, brought to uh, Cameron's attention, as it, he said, well, he did raise human rights matters as well. That was one of the reasons that he was there, um, as well as shilling for Greens. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a great, not a great look either. He looks very deferential to this, uh, and and the carpet and everything is kind of crazy as well. Isn't it? Um, is the UK doctor who discovered the blood clot link? She's she's not very popular tonight with. It's, uh, no, I th people, or perhaps uh, with um, officials over in Dublin. But um, as I said, the, it, there's a recognition that you are going to have these kind of bumps, and that they are trying to. Uh, I think there's a more tolerance than you might um, uh, might ordinarily expect uh, amongst ordinary people here, um, especially as they've beaten their uh, original timetable. And then uh, earlier today, I think the NHS website crashed because the under 40, the 45s uh, and older were um, encouraged oh. to get their um, to book their uh, jabs. So uh, it's it's imperfect, but it's not. Um, the way that if you look at say a year ago, uh, the mm. sheer ineptitude on PPE and the uh, dishonesty, um, I think there's different people in now who have less of a bunker mentality. Uh, this is uh, amongst people advising uh, Johnson, and sure. um, so they've learned that um, the barefaced lying, at least where they're going to be caught out, didn't work when with their last advisor. If you think. Uh, uh, Barnard Castle and uh, all the uh, all of that. So, yeah. um, there's also less burner. Uh, there's uh, there's less Boris, isn't there? Around it's, uh, I, I, he's yes. less visible, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, it's a good strategy, I think. Uh, vaccines for under forties in six weeks. This is a, again the UK. Um, that's why the 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 NHS thing crashed today. Is it? Um, yes, and the uh, um, the minister responsible for um, rolling out the vaccination um, it, it, it said that uh, it was a technical issue they fixed it and it's back online but it it was indicative of demand so. right and uh, morning star uh, British gas fight isn't over um, oh, yeah, British gas has been behaving appallingly uh, it's been uh, it's um, British gas is primarily a financial services firm these days but it um, has been looking to fire its staff and re-employ them on um, lesser terms and conditions um, that they have if they want their jobs back. Um, and, so, um, and that was one of the big privatizations, wasn't it, under Thatcher, the Telsid? Oh, yes. But, I mean, Remember Telsid? 40 years ago. I mean. Yeah, no, no, I mean, but that's, you know, yes. the, it was considered, you know, like... The, oh, yeah, and, but, yeah. And, uh, at the same time as well, I think there was the BP one uh, where people were so um, sort of, revved up by that they uh, didn't uh, they uh, didn't realize they could have actually bought the shares uh, cheaper in the normal way of things they were, <laughs> it was subscribing because um people were so unfamiliar with um uh, with a portfolio or kind of uh, dabbling in shares uh, it is i mean it's arguably uh, an, an achievement um, but it, it was part of the kind of uh, restructuring of the british society that happened happened under thatcher but um, British Gas has become, a, 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 I think it's changed its ownership a few times and its direction yeah. uh, quite a few times. Um, is it foreign owned? Or, or... Um, I'm not sure. Is it Centrica that owns it? Um, the, so, yeah. so I'd, I'd have to look at look up who the current owners are. And, uh, I've spoken to. Um, London Review of Books. Um, Krugman's conversion. I don't know. Is that That's Paul Krugman, the Economist, I don't know what his his conversion is though. To um, Financial Times, uh, Johnson Johnson, uh, Whitehall, the Whitehall procurement chief, and anything there that catches your eye? Well, we've been talking about some of it already. I mean, we've yeah. been talking about the uh, the main lead, and we've been talking about their off lead. Um, it's a, a paper that's been doing some, uh, under Rula Kalaf, its editor, um, and who took over from uh, Lionel Barber and under its Japanese owners, 
it's been doing some pretty fearless. Uh, I mean, it has its own particular uh, yeah. uh, value system, but uh, in terms of objective journalism uh, and research, it's been doing it's been doing good stuff. Yeah. Um, what what papers do you take yourself in uh, in London in the morning? Well, I've um, let me see the the Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Irish Times, the Financial Times. Um, Le Monde Diplomatique and uh, English Die Welt. And English? Die Welt. Oh, right, right, right. God, that's a, that's a, and the standard then in the evening? Of the... No, it's not really. Um, under George Osborne's uh, editorship, yeah. um, I think he's since left that to spend. Yeah. Another Bullingdon that. club guy. I mean, it is incredible. Isn't I, it? Don't, I, t- I don't know that he's in that photograph. I know that he uh, is. Uh, yeah. He is. Uh, well, yeah. he, uh, he had to put up with uh, um, an awful lot of abuse um, amongst them because he, he was seen as the povo or the, uh, the poor one because he went to St. Paul's Boys School. Oh. <laughs> so he got the wedgies and, oh, God, poor guy. Um, yeah, he does have that look of the kind of. He's a, he was actually a restraining influence on Cameron. He was the one who was opposed. Who, uh, he was very very loyal to Cameron. Um, yeah. They and he, uh, I mean, he would have thrived, say, um, in a buoyant Fianna Fáil administration, and if he had grown up somewhere else, uh, because he did have he does have political instincts. Uh, austerity is discredited. Um, it was. Mm. Uh, it was a, it was a completely false and mendacious platform, uh, which he pushed and using those domestic metaphors that he used for the budget. Um, yeah. But um, I, I don't. Um, I yeah, think there was more warmth than humanity in him and a disposition to act than one would necessarily have found in Brad Cameron. Yeah, yeah, and Boris probably as well. Yeah. Uh, there's quite a damning uh, piece, I think, in Prospect today by uh, one of a uh, very good piece, and it's just drawing on public uh, uh, record sources um, by um, a, a political columnist from The Times who had worked with him on The Telegraph, and uh, just uh, there's a litany of stories that could be told um, about Boris. Yeah. One of the things that has um, I mean, a, 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 there's a very decent uh, Tory backbencher Simon Hoare, who chairs the, he's a Welshman, who cha- he's with mm-hmm. Dorset MP and he chairs the Northern Ireland uh, Select Committee. Um, he, and he's been sane, level headed, uh, constructive. Um, and so I think he it basically comes from a uh, well disposed, well intentioned uh, place. He uh, tweeted the other day um, complimenting or uh, supporting. Johnson for having given up his seat at the um, funeral on Thursday, on Saturday, which is uh, confined to just 20 people, and that this was an act of um, decency and charity and selflessness. um, And um, describing Boris Johnson as selfless, uh, the poor man did not really, was not prepared for the uh, torrent of abuse and disbelief that he got. Really? Online and Mm. elsewhere? Yeah, well... Um, so what are your plans this week? Have you any anything lined up? I mean, now that you've got this sort of ease of movement in London and pubs well, open a bit. Um, if we still have to get a paper out. We're still trying to get stories. We've still got to try to persuade people to uh, um, buy it and read it. So, um, But you could go out for lunch now and maybe or, or tomorrow have a pint in the evening. Well, I mean, it's, outside. outside. Yeah, like just um, are you... Taking a more active role in city in in outside, getting outside. I'm never. I well, I get out anyway, but I've never yeah. been a pub goer. But where out behind me, um, there's a pub, uh, which is packed from people outside. It has a little theatre upstairs, which hasn't yet reopened. But around this particular part of London, um, just a short way away, is where um, Yates W. B. Yates lived with Jack Yates and his dad. Although they, to be fair, the dad kept skipping. Um, property, so there's a few plaques around, but right, yeah. um, the uh, Hammersmith, Hammersmith was one, wasn't it? Uh, yep, and uh, Sunday Mount as well. But I mean, he went, went, to, it went to school on um, I think it's Latimer, but they he wasn't in the uh, they didn't realize that uh, he was a, a an old boy or a past boy because uh, I think there's some dispute over payment of the fees. But, oh, really? uh, Roger Casement uh, had a house just around the corner as well. Wow, fascinating. 
and uh, George Bernard Shaw used to come over uh, expecting to um, uh, win the hand of William Morris's uh, daughter just uh, around the other corner. So there was, wow. uh, there was uh, wow. plenty of uh, low-key um, yeah, Irish roots. Yeah, fascinating. Right and that's Damon fun. Andrews used to uh, have a flat just on the green on the high road. So really? Really? Wow. Did you know Andrews? Um, Met him. Yeah. Very, um, very uh, um, unusual man, wasn't he? You were like, very impressive. Yeah. Like incredibly successful. Yes. You took know. the American formats and in, uh, introduced them to uh, a commercial TV here. He... Um, um, Huge, like wasn't he in the in the in the seventies and sixties and seventies in Britain? Fifties, sixties, and seventies. Yeah. yeah, amazing, really, and uh, as Irish as the you know, like uh, right through that period, you know, the seventies, there was no, not a bother on him. Do you know? Unapologetically so. I mean, he would, um, yeah. the flat that he, his wife and the kids lived in um, uh, Malahide, um, and he would go back from uh, he because uh, he'd be filming in Teddington, just down the way. Uh, and they, they would hold a plane for him at Heathrow uh, or give him the jump seat uh, with the air crew or uh, in flight staff or uh, even up in the cockpit if there wasn't a seat for him. And that was back yes. in the time when uh, the tickets were um, the the was owned and controlled. Yes. Yeah. But, um, so, uh, but he, as I said, he was, uh, the church on the high road, the family um, unveiled a uh, statue, I think, to patron saint of actors a couple of years ago. Uh, you know. it's, yeah, it's interesting, almost a little bit like Wogan, they don't really get as much sort of uh, coverage at home. You know, you don't really read much about Eamon Andrews. I mean, I know, you know. Well, I think there's a lot of people here today who wouldn't necessarily know who he was either because I guess, it's a long time ago. Yeah, I guess, but you know, one of our own, but um, at a time when there wasn't that many, you know, there was Tim Dave Allen, maybe and Wogan, you know. There was Dave Allen, there was Wogan, there was Eamon Andrews, uh, there was Val Dunican, um, there was uh, James Ellis, um, who was the actor in Z Cars and things like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Northern, was, Northern Ireland, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, Irish. But... Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah no, I... you don't want to be like a certain columnist on one of the uh, certain papers in Dublin, telling yes. people whether they're Irish or not, um, um, which uh, yeah. is a bit too much of. Um, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few. Harry Tao, I think, was another. Um, T.P. McKenna, you'd have known, who regularly yeah. played Russians um, and some <laughs> yeah. uh, dramas over here. John Le Carre, um, there wasn't he? The, the, yeah. you know, the, the Smiley's People, wasn't he? The, the, Yes, I think he played, um, and uh, also things like Callum. And, uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, Noel Purcell used to, uh, in the 60s, was in the, things like The Saint and uh, sure, all those yeah. Lou Gray pieces. So there were plenty of Irish here who would uh, just get on with. Um, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The, uh, Cyril Cusack as well, I suppose. Uh, he was in a lot of TV in the 70s, wasn't he? For... Yeah, he lived, lived here in Chiswick. Did he really? Yeah. yeah. Um, his uh, youngest daughter, Katha, um, also, um, she gave up uh, a role in uh, Coronation Street as the mad uh, babysitter or something, the uh, obsessive oh. babysitter uh, to uh, do uh, more theatre acting. Oh. Uh, she gave up the security of um, a uh, steady soap because she wanted to, to stay active. Easy. Um, yeah. No, I saw um, the three Cusack sisters and Cyril in uh, Three Sisters, I think, uh, in London years ago. Would that have been around 1988? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I took for the uh, Herald at the time when we were doing reviewer um, um, colour wraps weeks in advance, um, I actually had to set that up. So I it took uh, John Finnegan, uh, the sisters, um, and uh, Cyril. Uh, to dinner uh, or to lunch at Joe Allen's and to the uh, to a photo shoot at the uh, theatre museum. And uh, so as they walked in, uh, the uh, maitre d' went to take them all to one table and meet somewhere else. And I was paying the bill um, at least on behalf of Abbey Street. Um, so, and, um, and John Finnegan, the theatre critic, who used to babysit the um, girls when they were little, that was there. Uh, their mm -hmm. the so uh, that, so it's a really, time you were here, it's, um, yeah, incredible. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what, what theatre was that. It was quite a nice, big theatre, though. Is it? I can't remember. Yeah, it was, yeah. it, it's, um... it was good, anyway. I mean, yeah, I, yeah and Cyril. Uh, Cyril's also in Fahrenheit. Four, four, five. Five. 
yeah, four five one. Have you seen the movie? Yes, yeah, it's yeah. Um, it's the uh, French director. Um, uh, Godard. No, it wasn't Godard. It oh. was um, Truffaut. Tr- Truffaut, François Truffaut. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so yes. Uh, yeah, very uh, very it, timely. I mean, if you if uh, worth rewatching Bernard. Ray Bradbury was always timely, and uh, obviously uh, Truffaut would be as well. But it. I had that uh, German actor uh, who was um, also in Shoes of the Fisherman and in um, the famous new wave, uh, Eter- uh, Eternal Triangle. Um, the, it's a, but very, very. Yeah, but it, yes, it's a very, it's a very, very timely film, especially yeah. with the addiction to the uh, TV on the wall to try and keep people um, yeah. uh, stupefied. But uh, Bradbury. Um, any Ray Bradbury uh, short story or yeah. uh, novel it's still timely years on Great and Cusack's uh, pretty good in it too um, Bernard thanks a lot uh, great to have a chat with you and hope you have a good week uh, and England you and, and with the easing of restrictions and hopefully we'll see you next uh, Tuesday Absolutely and the Irish world is on sale in London tomorrow in Britain tomorrow and to Ireland on Thursday In Ireland the people who, uh, who tend to buy it are people who actually lived over here and went back and they ah. like to, they, uh, like to keep them connected with not so much Irish people um, in Ireland who get it, but uh, for instance, there's a, I think there's a restaurant or a cafe uh, just down by the airport in Kerry who used to be over here, so he keeps it there for people who move back and forth. And so there's people who have a connection with the pubs or the bands or the GA, but so it's Irish and Britain who've gone back who uh, tend to get the paper over there. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not competing with the indoor other times. No, no. I must talk about the Galti sign as well with you next week. Um, uh, Gavi located it. And... Um, I put you put that yeah. lady in contact with me, and I put her in contact with the gentleman at the Museum of London. And um, I'm not having heard from either of them since. Oh, okay. I can no. I mean, I got it. I can only assume it was successful and fruitful. Very successful, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you all next week. Uh, uh,